Hello everyone, a heartfelt welcome to all of you. I am Deshna and I will be your moderator for today's exciting exploration into Net Zero. I am delighted to lead you through a session filled with valuable insights and knowledge. Today we have a session full of informative conversations. Our wonderful speakers will guide us through Net Zero and the latest trends in decarbonization and the standards and framework. First up, we have Mr. Kadunakar Avram an expert in the sustainability sector with over 18 years of experience. His expertise spans environmental sustainability, energy efficiency, carbon mitigation, waste management, CSR and ESG disclosures. He is currently an expert advisor for ESG services at A2G and today he will be talking about the basics on net zero. Joining him is Mr. Rishabh Singh, a sustainability, a sustainability consultant at A2G. He excels in ESG reporting, strategy implementation, climate risk management, net zero initiatives, corporate sustainability, and circular economy. Rishabh has led numerous government projects across India. Today, he will be talking about decarbonization strategy and SBTI standards. Our final speaker is Mr. Hossein Parpia, a professional with 12 plus years of experience in environmental management and sustainability. He is an ISO 14001 EMS lead auditor, ISO 14064 GHG lead verifier, and a certified professional in carbon footprint by CII. Today, he will be talking about ISO guidelines on net zero and case studies. Let's dive into today's agenda of the webinar. Here's what we will have lined up for today. Net Zero, Introduction, the need for Net Zero, and Net Zero versus Carbon Neutrality. Second, Decarbonization Strategy. Third, Standards and Frameworks, SPTI and IISO Guidelines. Fourth, Case Study with a real-life example on the 3 plus 1C approach. Following the presentation, we will have an interactive Q&A session. Firstly, let's go over the few important meeting rules to ensure a smooth session. The meeting will be recorded. Only the discussions will be recorded. Q&A session shall be taken in the last. Kindly restrict the discussion to the mentioned topic. Note that all the attendees are on mute. For any queries, please use the raise hand feature. The moderator shall unmute and allow to speak in the Q&A round. Kindly introduce yourself and your organization briefly and, uh, and ask your question. In view of time limitation, you would request all to avoid repetitive questions. You may also please keep entering your queries in the chat box and we shall get back to you. Next, I would like to invite Mr. K Mr. Kalunaka Avram to get the webinar started. Thank you, Deshna. Can you confirm if you can hear me well? And good afternoon, everyone. Yes, so, uh, we can some... hear you well, so. Thank you, thank you. Some of the most common terminologies that we can hear these days in the context of environment sustainability are global warming, climate change, and uh, net zero. Let's try to understand what it means. See, global warming is a phenomenon of increasing global temperatures because of increased GHG concentration in the Earth's atmosphere. Now, presence of greenhouse gas emissions is necessary. Uh, you heard me right. Without the presence of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the average global temperatures on Earth's surface would have been sub-zero, which is difficult for, for our survival. So therefore, they are playing an important role. But the problem is with the increased concentration of greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere. A post-industrial era, we are seeing increased amount of CO2 and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, and that is leading to increase in global temperatures, and that is referred to as global warming, and which is leading to climate change. Now, if you look at the historical data from pre-industrial era, that is from 1850 to 2023, the average global temperature rise was about 1.2 degrees centigrade. Now, this is only 1.2 degrees centigrade, but you can see the impact of this 1.2 degrees centigrade. Right? So, uh, we all of us have witnessed a severe heat waves last summer, and Delhi recorded a temperature of more than 50 degrees centigrade. And recently, Wynard in Kerala received a 54 centimeters of rainfall in just 24 hours. 
So these are some, just few glimpses of the impact of climate change. And no one can deny that it is due to increase in CO2 because this can be clearly correlated with increase in CO2. And CO2 level has become doubled from 1850 to 2023. And the graph that you show see here, it shows if we continue to emit at the current level, by end of this century, we'll end up in 2.5 to 3 degree rise in temperature. And with 1.2 itself, we are facing severe issues of climate change. You can imagine how severe it would be with the 2.5 to 3 degrees centigrade rise in temperatures. Now, with some of the global commitments uh, on short-term goals, uh, if you look at the purple line, so we are likely to end up at 2.5 degrees centigrade. And with the long-term commitments and short-term goals, uh, it, it, we are likely to be at 2.5 degrees centigrade. And the most optimistic, optimistic scenario would be about 1.8 degrees centigrade. But what, what is required is the green line. That is, we need to keep it below 1.5 degrees centigrade. So that means we need to bring down the current level of emissions to half. Right now, it's about 54 to 55 gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year, and that needs to brought down to 25 to 27 gigatons of CO2. So that means we need to reduce the, the GH emissions exponential a drastic reduction it happened. So if that is to happen, all of us, every company and all of us individuals need to contribute to bring down these GHG emissions. Yeah, go to the next slide, please. Now this slide shows what would be the impact with the two degree rise in temperatures versus 1.5 degrees centigrade, because globally everybody is talking about that we need to keep it below 1.5 degrees centigrade, although the difference is only 0.5 degrees centigrade, but you can see the difference in magnitude of impact is severe. For example, with the 2 degrees centigrade, about 2.7 billion people will be affected due to uh, heat waves is against 1 billion people with 1.5 degrees centigrade. Similarly, similarly severe droughts will, will affect about 410 million people against 350 million people. And sea level rise will affect about 49 million people against 46 million people. And there's several other impacts. And increase in flood risk will be about 170% with 2 degrees, while it's 100% with 1.5 degrees centigrade. And there's going to be huge impact on biodiversity. Both flora and fauna will be affected. Vegetation, animals, birds, uh, uh, sea life, everything is going to be affected with the increase in global temperature. So that's a major problem. So we, uh, everyone across the globe, need to work in this direction to bring down the global temperatures. Next slide, please. So if you look at the, the path of net zero, in fact, the whole of climate change movement began uh, before 2000 itself, but from 2006 onwards, where, since when the uh, GHG protocol came out with the guidelines to inventorize GHG emissions, the movement uh, became more serious and companies have started understanding the GHG emissions with the guidelines published by GHG protocol. And in, in 2009, uh, a professor, uh, Professor Miles Selen from Oxford University is the one who proposed um, on net zero that we need to look at the overall uh, uh, natural emissions and anthropogenic emissions and removals to see the net impact of CO2 into the atmosphere that is responsible for global warming. And of course, later in, in 2013, IPCC came out with its report where it emphasized that uh, to uh, we I mean it is necessary to keep net anthropogenic CO2 emissions into the atmosphere zero to combat the global warming impact of the climate change. And we understand in 2015 there's a Paris Agreement where all the countries came together and they signed an agreement that we all need to work towards climate change in order to keep the global rise in temperatures to below uh, 2 degrees centigrade, 1.5 degrees centigrade. And in 2018, IPCC published another report where it clearly emphasized it is necessary that we achieve net zero emissions by end of this century if we have to keep it to 1.5 degrees centigrade. So we'll understand what is this net zero in the next slide. Can we go to the next slide, please? So there are positive emissions, there are negative emissions. Negative emissions means emission removals. For example, if you look at positive emissions, that means these are the emissions released by anthropogenic activities into the atmosphere. So for example, your, uh, you must be having boilers, right? the fuel consumption boilers, uh, will result in uh, CO2 emissions, that is combustion-related emissions. 
uh, that's from the stationary combustion and uh, you, you you would be having vehicles i mean the use of petrol and diesel in in vehicle so there will be CO2 emissions from the combustion of fuel in vehicles and there are fidgety emissions like for example uh, leakage of refrigerants from your air conditioning and refrigeration system and there would be CO2 emissions from your fire extinguishers so these are the various types of GHG emissions from typically from a manufacturing setup and these are termed as direct emissions or scope emissions and there are other indirect emissions for example the purchase the electricity that you would be consuming so because electricity is also produced from fossil fuels that's the scope to emissions and and of course cutting down of forest because this affects the earth's capacity to absorb uh, i mean the nature's capacity to absorb co2 emissions and then of course other indirect emissions like supply chain emissions which are referred to as scope to emissions which are which will arise from purchase goods and services business travel and like commute etc on the other hand if you look at the emission removals now we are we are blessed to have good nature i mean the forest for example amazon rainforest after that matter any forest absorbs co2 because the trees absorb co2 uh, so that that's one way the other is the uh, anthropogenic removal mechanisms like uh, uh, co2 capturing utilizing storage it is therefore to ccu is this another way to uh, remove co2 from the atmosphere so we understand it is impossible to completely stop emitting GHG emissions, but what we need to look at is whether the emissions are balanced by the removals. As long as the emissions are balanced by removals, we are on the safe side. That is what is called net zero emissions. Next slide, please. So, yeah, so we must have heard about carbon neutrality and net zero. So there is slight difference because earlier companies were focusing on carbon neutrality. For example, I was earlier working with Godrej and we had a carbon neutral target. We set a target in 2010 itself to achieve by 2020. Uh, so in fact, IPCC has an interesting definition both for carbon neutrality and net zero. IPCC defines if anthropogenic CO2 emissions are balanced by CO2 removals, that is termed as carbon neutral. Well, when it comes to net zero, it's not just CO2, but including other GHG, that is overall GHG emissions. If net GHG emissions, that means anthropogenic GHG emissions are balanced by uh, GHG removals, that is what is termed as net zero. But in practical, when companies set a carbon neutral target, the strategy many companies adopt over, for example, if I'm emitting 100 tons of CO2 into the atmosphere, if I can offset 100 tons of CO2 elsewhere, I can claim that I have achieved carbon neutrality. That is a strategy many companies have adopted. But not, but now it is net zero. It's no longer just offsetting. What we need is basically to reduce emissions by 90%, at least by year 2050. There's, of course, short-term target as well, as we saw in another uh, slide. Uh, companies need to reduce their emissions by 50% by the year 2030 and 90% by year 2050. And this includes all three scopes, scope one, two, and three. So, so that way, the companies can align their uh, targets in line with 1.5 degrees centigrade pathway. And of course, there are standards also to govern. SBTI is one that is actually uh, driving this net zero moment. Next slide, please. So there are uh, okay, now if you look at why do corporates need to go for net zero, and there are several benefits also. Now, the one, of course, the first one is companies can demonstrate their commitment towards environment sustainability, what they are taking towards mitigating climate change and environment sustainability. The, the second is there is a regulatory compliance. In fact, there are several regulations coming up. For example, EPD Environment Product Declaration, which EU has mandated carbon tax in several countries, CBAM, EUDR, which uh, European Union has come up recently, and of course, India has also come up with the BRS. And there are several regulatory requirements also. So companies need to demonstrate their actions towards mitigating climate change. There are, of course, economic benefits as well. And several companies have witnessed by moving from fossil-based uh, energy sources, that is from non-renewable non energy sources to renewable energy sources. Uh, they have also uh, witnessed significant amount of uh, uh, cost savings in terms of reducing their operation expense. For example, when you reduce energy, uh, when you improve energy efficiency, your electricity bill or your energy bill will come down. And similarly, by shifting from, say, coal to other uh, bio-based fuels, and several companies have reduced their operation costs as well. 
The other reason is increased stakeholder expectations and there is increased push from the investors community on the companies to demonstrate their commitment towards climate change. And in fact, customers, especially if you are into B2B business, several of customers have started asking their suppliers to demonstrate the actions towards climate change mitigation. And of course, generally, uh, companies performing well on sustainability front are able to attract good employees and the employee retention rate will be better. Uh, the, of course, the other the other reason is uh, your, your brand reputation will go up uh, if you can demonstrate that you're taking uh, sustainable initiatives or climate change mitigation initiatives, your corporate image will go up because now there are several rating agencies that are, that are assessing companies based on what is available in public domain and they're assessing and rating companies. Um, and of course, the companies which perform well on climate change can also manage their climate change and operation risks better. And of course, uh, the other one is, as we say, necessity is mother of invention. And once you set a target of net zero and you're bound to think beyond. So, and that's that's how it's helping companies also to come out with some innovative solutions and new and new technologies are also coming up to combat the climate change. And companies that work on climate change can also build their resilience towards climate change risks. And of course, last but not the least is you can also contribute towards the global commitment, be it in terms of Paris Agreement or sustainable development goals. So there's the various reasons why companies need to go for net zero. Uh, so with this background, I hand over my colleague, uh, Rishabh, who can take you through some of the strategies to achieve net zero uh, goals. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kalnakal, for the insightful information. And now I invite Mr. Ritab Singh to speak about the decarbonization and the net zero specific framework. Thank you. So to understand the decarbonization journey of, of a firm, a very typical example, we have taken the three C approach. The three C's here. Dishna, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, sure. The three C's here represent calculate, cut down, and compensate. So here, these three C we typically call them the strategic triads for the net zeros. And we will de delve them into each of these three C's in the next slides. So we're talking about the first C. So first C is about calculating your baseline GHG emissions. So we will take each of the scopes separately. So for scope one, as mentioned earlier also, there are three major types of emissions that we have. The first is the emission from your stationary combustion. The second is, is emission from your mobile combustion. And the third one is the fugitive emissions. So from stationary combustion basically in, uh, consists of combustion from your fuels that you use in your operations. So that could be coal, pet coke, fuel oil, LPG, diesel, petrol, and others. For mobile combustion, it is mostly through emissions from the company owned vehicles uh, that could be through diesel or petrol combustion in your vehicles. The fugitive emissions could be use of refrigerants uh, in any of your machines or facilities or the CO2 leakages from, let's say, fire extinguishers. So we have, as you can see in the screen, uh, we have taken one example of a firm in which we have mentioned the emission from all these sources and the total emissions uh, constitute about 79,400 metric tons CO2 equivalent in scope one. Now for scope two, we have purchased electricity, purchased steam and purchased heat. So total scope two emissions amount to around 1.97 lakhs. For scope three, we have only taken the categories uh, there are 15 categories in G as per the JG protocol. We have taken five categories which are relevant to the particular industries and which are the most emission hotspots because it is difficult to inventorize all the categories in scope three. So the five categories that we have taken is purchase goods and services, fuel and energy, upstream transportation and distribution, employer commit and downstream transportation and distribution. So as you can see on the screen, the total emissions amount to about 14 lakh metric tons of CO2 equivalent. So in this stage, we have calculated our baseline emissions and now we will move on to the next C which is the cut down. Next slide Deshna. Yeah. So since now we have conducted our baseline assessment we will have to take initiatives to cut down our emissions. So for scope one uh, as we see in the scene in the last slide, uh, the fuel combustion in our operations was one of the major sources of scope one. So we were using coal or coal and pet coke in our operations let's say in our boilers. So we can use PNG or brickets which are very less carbon, in, uh, PNG is obviously quite less than coal and brickets is kind of about, there are some biogenic emissions, but where are, but compared to the traditional fossil fuels, the emissions are very less. So this could be the first initiative. The other initiative could be energy efficiency in terms of improvements in your operational 
maintenance and the control that you have over of the assets or the machines that you have in your facilities. The third initiatives could be reduction in your process emissions. So for heavy emission intensive sectors like cement industry or the steel industry, there are a lot of process emissions. So you can work on imp improve uh, on some new technologies through which you can reduce your process emissions. The other initiative could be investment in new technologies based uh, which are low carbon intensive, uh, which could help you reduce your emissions uh, going forward in the future. And for your company owned vehicles, for especially for mobile combustion, you can have initiatives of uh, having electrical vehicles. Similarly for scope two, uh, so there are some initiatives that you can take that is uh, purchases of open access power. So now this is a very common in even the government of India came in 2020 with the green op open energy access scheme. So you can go, go for renewable energy from open access through wind, solar, hydro, or if possible, you can have your captive solar plants also or solar panels on your rooftops. For scope three, some of the initiatives that you can take for category one, that is purchase goods and services and category two, that is capital goods is sustainable sourcing. For category three emissions, you could have renewable energy sourcing. So that will help you to reduce your cradle to gate emissions in the category three. For category four and category nine, that is upstream and downstream transportation and distribution, you can go for optimization of your logistics. For category five, that is waste in your operations, you can have you can go for circular economy initiatives, that is reduction of waste and the five R's that we commonly say reuse, refurbish, remanufacture or recycling. So these initiatives, if you take, if you see the overall reduction that we could have, uh, the typical example that we have taken is in scope one, we have reduced around 23,000. 400 metric tons of CO2 equivalent in scope two around 1.21 lakhs and scope three around 87,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent. Next slide. Yeah. So now we have taken the steps for cut down, cut downing our emissions in this second C. The third C is about compensating. So even after taking the uh, cut down initiatives, obviously it's not possible to cut down your entire emission. There would be some residual emissions for sure. So for that, we can have the third C that is compensating of emissions, which is mainly for the carbon offsets. So for scope one to offsetting your emissions, you could take initiatives like plantation of trees, trading of energy saving certificates. If you are part of the bad scheme by the government and you are a designated consumer, then you can go for this also. Uh, you can go for purchase, you know, purchase of carbon credits from the open market, or you can go invest in carbon clean development projects through which you can earn carbon credits by investing in a country, uh, other countries renewable energy projects. For scope three, you can go for RECs that is renewable energy certificates. It could be national RECs or international RECs as well, or you can have a purchase power agreements with any RE generator. In scope three, you can have initiatives similar to scope one, like plantation of trees, purchase of carbon credits, and investment in CDM. So overall, if you see, we have uh, by offsetting, we have reduced our uh, scope for emission by 3.5 thousand metric tons, scope two by 16,000, and scope three by 31,000. So in total, uh, if you see uh, compared to our baseline in scope one, scope two, scope three, we have around 33% reduction in scope one. We have around 69.5% reduction in scope two emissions, and around 8.4% in scope three. So obviously scope three is little challenging in terms of taking initiatives. So gradually the companies go on to that path of uh, redu reducing the scope three emissions. But obviously a lot of companies are currently working on reduction, uh, work, uh, reduction and offsetting their scope one and scope two emissions. Next slide. So since we have understand a basic concept of the three C's of calculating your emissions, cut downing, and then finally compensating it through with offsets. Now let us move on to the some of the standards that we have for setting net zero targets. So we will delve into two standards. First is SBTI, and the second is the ISO. So for SBTI was uh, this came into picture in 2015. So it's a partnership between the CDP, the United Nations Global Compact, the World Resources Unit uh, Institute, and the World Wide Fund. So it's a collaboration between these four organizations. It's a global uh, coalition, and uh, basically their aim is to they have launched multiple campaigns throughout uh, their since since their inception in 2015. So one of the campaigns that currently they are running is the race to zero campaign. Earlier they had the business ambition of 1.5 degrees Celsius campaigns through which they basically urge or you know they launch a. Uh, kind of a call, call to action for all the 
business leaders, the industry leaders, the different organization and institutions to set up their science based net zero targets aligned with the 1.5 degrees Celsius future. So these science based targets basically enable the companies and the financial institutions to know how quick what actions they need to do and how, when they need to do so that they could, you know, uh, uh, prevent the worst impacts of the climate change by 2030 in the near future and 2050 uh, for the long term. So science based targets uh, setting has become a common part of many of the com current companies reporting practice because it is backed by CDP and it is uh, uh, included in the CDP questionnaire and a scoring and thus many company are now, now taking uh, this science based targets in uh, initiatives uh, setting and also since uh, uh, this is uh, being published through many disclosures it has become the part of the global infrastructure for the in institutional investors and obviously investors are very important for any company so companies are very aggressively now working towards setting these targets so be, uh, to understand what is the basic process of setting the targets first is you have to submit a commitment letter to SBTI for setting this target, then you will have to develop a strategy for that. You have to first get your baseline and emissions. Then you have to set targets based on different approaches and the guidelines that the SBTI has made be the sectoral sectoral decarbonization approach or the absolute construction approach or there are other multiple approaches as well. Then you have to submit your targets for validation to SBTI. Once it is validated, you can communicate your targets to the external holders and the most important is tracking the progress on these targets quarterly and annually and reporting the same to your stakeholders. Next slide. So uh, uh, we will just look into what are the methods and the options for target setting. So we'll first look into what are the methods for scope one and scope two. So we have targets two types of targets in SBTI. One is the short term targets and the second is the uh, uh, long term targets. So for uh, uh, if you uh, talk about scope one and two, the first approach that we have is the absolute contraction. So this is basically re reduction of your overall total emissions in line with the emission of 1.5 degrees Celsius. So SBTI suggest for this setting these targets for the near term, you should have at least uh, a minimum linear reduction of 4.2% per annum. And for the long term, by 2050, you should have a re reduction of overall reduction of 90%. So SPTI uh, for SPTI, the near term means 2030 and the long term is 2050. The second approach that we have is a physical intensity convergence. This is the method in which there is a concept that all the different uh, companies in a particular sector or industry will converge to a common uh, emission in physical emission intensity over a period of time. So for near term target setting, you can use the decarb sectoral decarbonization approach formula, which will automatically align your targets based on your baseline year, the target year and the projected growth output that you have over the years. For setting the long term targets, it's something in which your company's emission intensity should be equal to the sector's emission intensity in 2050. And for all the sectors, it is 2050, but for specifically for power sector, this has been kept to 2040 as per the SPTI guidelines. There is also targets on renewable electricity for scope 2 only. So SPTI suggests to have renewable electricity of around 80% by 2025 and 100% by 2030. Now coming to the scope 3 target setting, the first approach is the absolute contraction. This is similar to scope 1 and uh, scope 2 setting, but here SPTI suggests a linear reduction of 2.5% of emissions per annum and for the long term by 2050, you have to reduce your overall emission by 90%. This physical intensity converges is also similar to what we have seen in scope 1 and scope 2. Uh, you have to reduce uh, your, your emissions, overall emissions by 90% for long term and short term you have to use the SDA sectoral decarbonation approach formula to set your targets. The third approach is the physical intensity contraction. This is let it, let's bit similar to uh, the physical intensity convergence. However, in this method, the companies have the flexibility to, to select the emission intensity metric uh, of their own choice. And based on that, they can set the targets in line with well below 2.5 degrees Celsius scenario for the near term and 1.5 degrees Celsius for the long term. So here, SBTI suggests a uh, reduction of your uh, scope 3 emission by 7% CGR uh, on a CGR basis and 97% or no overall reduction in the long term by 2050. The economic intensity is something you can reduce your emissions based on an economic quality. Let's say for done CO2 equivalent per unit of value done. 
so that could be one economic factor that you can take for intensity and here also the spti suggests a uh, linear uh, uh, sorry a uh, cgr reduction of around 7% per annum 7% uh, and uh, overall reduction of 90% for by 2050 we have also an engagement uh, concept that is only for setting scope 3 near term targets in which you can basically set uh, ask your suppliers or your value chain partners to have targets on some, some percentage of your own emissions to basically set, uh, set your own emissions. So let's say if you have 10,000 metric tons of emissions for certain, let's say five, five, uh, 2,000 uh, tons of emission, you can basically ask your sub value chain partners to have targets on those. So then you can also align your targets accordingly. So these are the five approaches that we have for scope three target setting. Next slide. Yeah. So for IOC standards, I would like Hussain to please take over. Hi. In the context of standards for net zero, we have an exciting development. The International Standards Organization is creating a standard for not net zero, focusing on the requirements for net zero transition and verification of claims. Like some of the ISO standards you may know of, it will be independently verifiable and is expected to launch at COP30 in November 2025. This standard will build on the existing net zero guidelines published by I, uh, ISO, which we will discuss in the next slide. Its goal is to enhance public trust and combat green, uh, green, greenwashing by verifying the credibility of net zero claims. Next slide, please. Let's briefly explore the key highlights of the ISO guidance on net zero. Leadership and commitment organizations must clearly commit to achieving both interim and long-term net zero targets. Scope and boundaries, the guidance requires that the net zero targets should encompass all scope one, two, three emissions within the organization's full boundary. Planning and mitigation, it calls to develop comprehensive mitigation plans that prioritize emissions reductions using recognized accounting standards and third party verifications. Target setting and actions, the guidance requires setting ambitious long term targets for net, net zero by 2050. With substantial interim goals, also it requires to prioritize significant emission reductions based on, before considering removals. Transparency and accountability, equity and innovation. This guidance emphasizes the importance of transparency, equity, justice and fostering innovation and collaboration in achieving net zero goals. Next slide, please. Our net zero case study focuses on the net zero transition of one of the leading pharmaceutical companies in India. The business lines include pharmaceutical services, active ingredients, global generics, proprietary products. Its products and services include active ingredients, custom pharmaceutical services, generics, and other formulations. It has 16 manufacturing facilities in India and four manufacturing facilities overseas. Next slide, please. Now let's look at the targets set by the company for scope one and two targets. As you can see, the base year is set to 2021 and the company has both absolute and intensity targets. The targets are science based aligned to the two degree pathway. It is important to note here that this company was one of the early adopters of science based initiative. And instead of two degree pathway, SBTI now only accepts commitments for 1.5 degree pathway. Absolute target is set to 25% and intensity target is 50% reduction with 2031 as a target year. The intensity figure in the base year is 2.78 metric tons of CO2 equivalent in the base year and has reduced to 1.4 metric tons of CO2 equivalent in the reporting year per unit of activity. The company also aims to transition to 100% renewable power by 2030 and 66% by 2025. For scope 3, the base year is set to 2022 and the target is to reduce emissions by 12.5% uh, by the year 2030. Next slide, please. Now let's explore initiatives and impacts towards reducing scope on emissions. For initiatives in green fuel switchover, the company has switched from coal and furnace oil powered boilers to natural gas and biomass power powered boilers. With initiatives for energy efficiency, the company has implemented diverse projects, including energy audits, process efficiency improvements, a key highlight here was the installation of low temperature evaporator with mechanical compressor. Uh, 
for initiatives in carbon sequestration, the company has planted 30 plus thousand saplings for afforestation, both within and beyond the fence. As you can see on the right, the initiatives have significantly improved, uh, reduced the scope on uh, emissions and the company is on path to achieve its targets. Next slide, please. Still waiting for the slide dish, no? Yeah. Now let's take a look at the initiatives and impacts towards reducing scope to emissions. For initiatives in renewable power, the company has installed solar rooftops, acquired solar power plants, switched to biomass boilers and engaged in various interstate open access and third party power purchase agreements. Within initiatives for energy efficiency, the company has implemented diverse projects, including energy audits and process efficiency improvements. I'm sorry. Yeah. For, for initiatives in carbon sequestration, the company has planted 30 plus thousand saplings for afforestation, both within and beyond the fence. As you can see on the right, the initiatives are significantly reduced scope to emissions, and the company has already achieved 42% renewable power by 20, 2023 and 40% intensity reduction from base year. Next slide, please. Now let's take a look at the initiatives and impact towards reducing scope three value chain emissions. There are some inter interesting projects the company has initiated. The energy conservation, renewable energy and fuel substitution resulted in significant emission reduction in category three. They have moved 85% of the air freight to sea freight. For initiatives in sustain sustainable packaging, the company has replaced pet laminated cartons with cardboard. And they have introduced recycled content and biodegradable and compostable materials where possible. Next slide, please. So let me briefly introduce A2G services in the ESG domain. We have ESG leadership advisory and strategy. We also do materiality assessment and stakeholder engagement along with ESG baseline assessment. Uh, in the context of this webinar, carbon footprint is an essential step uh, uh, in the net zero journey. Uh, climate risk mitigation goals and initiatives, uh, performance management and governance, and also external reporting and ratings, wherein uh, we do reportings on BRSR, GRI, and all the major global uh, reporting standards and ratings frameworks. Now I would want I would like to sincerely thank our amazing speakers and each one of you in the audience who have made this webinar a real success. We understand there are a lot of questions. Please book a free consultation with our team where our team will be happy to help you understand and strategize your company's ESG journey for you and answer your, quer answer your queries. The link to book the consultation is shared in the chat. Thank you, everyone.